yeah, today, because the last week is uh, is uh, kind of like, uh, introducing the book in about the uh, how how we can try to do the study group in this session. Uh, th uh, in this session, and then uh, today I'm gonna try to explain the chapter two, which is modeling process. So, actually, chapter two aims to present the overall process, overall steps for conducting or implementing machine learning techniques. So, uh. I personally think that what the author intend to do in here is uh, just try to skimming through the all the process of the for the for the machine learning technique or machine learning method. So it actually generally tells about the each uh, just the steps you can take when you can implementing some of the machine learning techniques. So it, that means chapter two is very important. I guess, because it actually explains about the overall overall kind of uh, steps for uh, for the for the machine learning, and then the uh, rest of the the rest of the chapter in this book is uh, just kind of uh, um, explaining the some specific technique, and then but the thing is all the all the machine learning technique uh, explained in this book gonna be based on the steps that uh, that are mentioned in this chapter. So, so that's the how this book actually organized when maybe authors try to publish, which is very nice, nice setup because the first day um, authors actually, this book actually explains about the, what's the, essential step for the conducting the machine learning technique. And then the rest of the chapter is uh, fo uh, are focusing on the just kind of explain the specific techniques based on the, uh, by following the, these steps in the chapter two. So, so I, and then, and then also, I personally think that I'm not familiar with the machine learning technique right now, so, uh, when I looking at the chapter two, I I don't think I can understand the whole thing, but I try to my best as best as as best as I can to explain the, what the steps is about. And then I personally think that this one is very important. Okay, so let's start. So in the chapter two, uh, okay, hold on. Oh, this one is not supported. Oh, okay. I can using. Uh, I can using Zoom, Zoom drawing ten, the Zoom drawing tool. Then okay. Cause that is what is the good about the Zoom. Cause the Zoom always had the very nice drawing tool. Okay. Sorry, uh, can you see my my drawing? Ah uh, yes, yes. Okay, gotcha. So, so okay. So when in here in chapter two, when uh, it says about the the modeling process, is the very iterative and heuristic heuristic based kind of uh, steps, which means. We uh, in the process we actually keep repeating the sum of the steps to get to the opti optimal model, and also heuristic based is a kind of like a, when we get the result is uh, we actually try to interpret the each repeated kind of findings and then uh, try to try to select the most the best result result for. Um, under the some uh, a specific model, so what the overall what the modeling process for the machine learning is about is uh, just kind of finding the optimal model by repeating the our uh, modeling modeling approaches for our data set. 
So that means most of the machine learning approach is actually applied, evaluated, and modified before we get to the final final model for result, which means that's the, what the iterative is about. And then uh, Bug also says approaching the machine learning model very correctly, it means we have to spend in data wisely, which means we, I'm going to talk about this one later, but this one is, I personally think, the most important part because uh, this one is uh, actually talking about the, how we can spend the data means how we can split in our data set by, uh, into the training and testing data that actually allows us to obtain the final optimal, optimal model that allows us to predict the classifications or predict the sum of the value based on the, our optimal model more accurately and more precisely. And then uh, properly processing is the kind of how we can deal with uh, these data set after splitting it. And then uh, minimizing data decrease means that we actually try to using as complete, uh, using our data as complete as possible. So that's the another thing. And then the tuning the parameter means uh, how we can set it, set up the set up or reorganizing some of the predictors, predict or predictive variable in response to the outcome variable is a very important. And also, okay, it's a mistyping. So accessing the model performances, which is a, this is a more kind of like a, how we can access to the performance of the model that we just made based on the, our data set or our sampling data, uh, data sets that actually needs to be assessed to get in terms of the performances because we have to make sure if our model actually perform uh, accurately and precisely based on our research question or research objectives. So when you're looking at the, the figure 2.1, it actually uh, visualized about the overall machine learning process. Because uh, uh, in first, uh, when we say about the spending data wisely means if we, when we have uh, all the data set in here, we actually try to split the two parts. One is the training data, the other one is the testing data. So to test, uh, when we try to develop the model, for the machine learning, we only use the training data set first to train the, what is called the train the model. But to do that, we actually divide a set of the resampling, resampling uh, data, data sets, which is uh, this one gonna be, I'm gonna talk about in the later text, uh, chapter, but this one is actually validation data set sets. So we do not use the training data just only one time. We try to make a lot of variations, variations in the data organizations through the different kinds of resampling method. And then based on the, these resampled data sets, we actually create, we actually try to make a make a model for each each sem, each sampled data set and then based on the some kind of a tuning process we can develop another model and then another model etc which means we can based on the our structure of the structure of our data set we're gonna test in the as many machine learning algorithms Rhythm actually as many as many as possible to testing the model based on our structure of the data set. And then throughout the, all of the, these steps, and then we can finally get to the validate, uh, optimal model through the uh, assessing the model performances. And then using, and then in the optimal model, we can use the uh, testing data after we get to the optimal model to get to the result and also test also examine the 
if the our model also uh, hold valid when we using the testing data set. So this one is a whole kind of a processing. So we divide first we divide the uh, data and then uh, for the training data set we developed a more variation to develop the more deep, more kind of a modeling alternatives. And then we keep testing and evaluating these mode, all of the, these model, which is the very iterative and heuristic based process in here. And then throughout the, this process, we can get to the optimal model. And then the two tests to, to test the optimal model performances. And then we, use, we apply to the testing data for the optimal model to see the if the model performs very well even when we apply to the new testing data set. Okay. So any questions? Anything? Uh, no, uh get canto, right? Yeah. Canto. Uh, yeah. Uh, one of the things that probably the author will be talking about, especially in 2.5, the bias variance trade off, yeah. yeah. is that uh, one of the one of the challenges yeah. that you're going to see, you know, when you put this in practice, mm -hmm. is that because we are working on the training data, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the model uh, learns the training data, data too well. Okay, mm -hmm. in other words, incorporates yeah. uh, some noise yeah. on the on the on the in the model. Yeah, and when you go then to apply that model, optimized model to the testing data, yeah. you get a gap in the metric. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, and that's something that is called uh, usually what is called is overfitting. In other words, your model is very good at predicting the training data, at explaining the training data but not the testing data, which is the, the data that is unknown to the model, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the one that is coming into the pipeline to mm -hmm. try to then, you know, get predictions for, uh, you know, consequently for, uh, for, for the future, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the, that, that's going to be one of the challenges. So you have to really uh, couple those together. You have to, uh, Optimize your training data, but make sure that you don't, uh, when you apply to the testing data, mm -hmm. you don't get that gap or at least minimize that gap. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then what, you know, when, when you attain that, that, you know, sweet spot, what, uh, what you have is a more generalized uh, model. Okay. That when new data comes, then that model can you know, uh, uh, predict uh, the results are not going to be too far away from the original uh, training data. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so yeah. that, that's something yeah. that you know is going to be always in your mind. Yeah, uh, you know, when doing all this, all this uh, modeling uh, process. Yeah, that is actually relates to the step for the maybe the tuning parameter and then accessing the model performances because. Uh, mm -hmm. To reduce the, those kind of a risk for the predictions or maybe accurate classifications, we keep right. trying to tune in the parameters and then uh, keep evaluating the, our model performances to reduce the, those risk. Because uh, yeah, we also need to be very cautious about the overfitting. We also need to be cautious about the under underfitting kind of a problem because mm -hmm. uh, we actually have a uh, too, too naive kind of uh, interpretations of the right. model that also give us uh, a lot of errors. It can be the more, we can get the more simplified, the generalizable result, but that also produced a lot of risk to get to the more errors, especially for the biases. So, mm -hmm. so overfitting actually can be solved very, very, uh, uh, through the, a lot of, uh, you uh, by using the, a lot of technique mentioned in this chapter, but on the, in case of the underfeeding is a kind of like a very hard to catch because 
on the model by itself is uh, very correct and uh, uh, interpretable and feasible. So it is actually up to our intuition to, to check if model, if we think model is under feeding or not. Because uh, when we say about the model is a kind of under, under feeding, that is actually very hard to find about how we can try to try to fit our model better. Because uh, that means we have to figure out the, what, what kind of uh, external factors we missed in, in this research or project. So overfeeding is uh, quite simple because uh, over, in case of the overfeeding, that means we, have a too, we might have a too many predictors to predicting the outcomes. In that case, we can reduce the, our variable or maybe tuning the, our, variable, our parameters or our variable to get to the optimal model. But in case of the underfeeding problem, that means we actually did not prepare our data set uh, completely or maybe, maybe not fit uh, uh, for the, our purposes. That means we have to revisit the, our our data set again and then I try to figure out the, what's, the, what's the other predictors we have to include it to our data set to get to the optimized, uh, optimized model in the machine learning process. So yeah, that is actually a good point. So because underfeeding and overfeeding both are the very, very, uh, we need to be cautious about the, uh, when we develop our, our model and then we to to testing the those things always testing the model performances and tuning the parameters and then checking the bias and variance trade off should be necessary. Okay, so let's talk about the prerequisites. Prerequisite is just kind of a, what what we need to be installed and then we need to be loading the packages. So in this chapter especially the H2O and then a carrot and the sampling package is a very kind of a critical uh, critical L uh, components for conducting the machine learning uh, um, processes uh, pro procedures and also in this chapter it used uh, uh, AMS housing data set and then I personally think that when you try to run the code in the in the book, I think that especially for uh, for this one, like a, like a, this part, the model data addition is the different, because uh, in in the chapter actually uses the two data set. One is the AMS housing, and the other one is the job attribution data from the CPS census survey in the United States. But but the thing is when you when you try to try to run the uh, run the code in the book, actually it says about the, in here it says about the R sample. Right? But the thing is this one does not work for me and then it actually producing the error. So when I checking the that where this data come from, I found that that data actually come from the package called model data. So you have to install the, these packages and then when you learn the, this code, you can get the uh, IBM job at, uh, attrition data set, okay? Cause uh, that means uh, in the book, actually it says about the R sample, but it doesn't, it is not in the R sample packages it actually uh, stores in the model data packages, okay? So when you, you have to learn the this code to get to the this data set. So I think that the author should have mentioned this one is error term kind of a report. But what I found is uh, when I get to the error and then when I check the this data set, this data set actually in the model data. And then also, when you say here is the mutated if is a kind of like a converting, uh, converting the 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 uh, the factor, uh, the ordered very ordered factor variable into the just kind of a normal one. 
because uh, into the H2O packages cannot read uh, this kind of a factor variable, especially for the older one. So, so the author recommends about the two, we need to transform the, this kind of a factor variable into the normal kind of a classification variable to use the HO packages. And then, and then HO packages actually use the, their own specific data class, which is the H2O object. So this one actually, we actually try to, uh, we can get the actually try to data frame, like a, like a actually exactly speaking is a tidy table, but we have to convert this one to the H2O object to use, use the data set in the H2O packages. So, so that's the how this one actually Converted and then uh, converted and the code is look like it's the same thing for the for the AMS housing. So when we get to the AMS housing data set, we also have to be transform uh, convert that data frame uh, class into the H two objects to use that data in the H two packages. So. Next chapter is about the data splitting. So that means actually our goal of the machine learning algorithm is uh, uh, actually the others summarize the, the purpose of the machine learning algorithm very well because uh, it is called the generalizability of an algorithm, which means we want an algorithm that on, not only fits well to our past data, which means this one is a more like our traditional kind of a data, uh, data mod uh, modeling approaches, right? Because uh, we actually access to the existing data set to get to the, to understand the relationship among the variable, right? But in the machine learning approaches, we also try to try to pursue the model that predict the future outcome correctly. So that means, uh, not only to the associations between the between the variables, we also we also try to try to conduct our machine learning algorithm to for the more like a pre prediction purposes. So which is a very very important. So that's the kind of a generalizability of the machine learning algorithm, and then which is the main objective of the machine learning algorithm. So to, to predict the future outcome correctly, the first thing we have to do is the spending data, our, our data wisely, which means we have to splitting our data set. So in the 2.1, we already talked about the, when we splitting our data set, we split our data set into the two data sets, two types of the data sets, which is the training data set. The other one is the test data set. Training data, we already talked about the definition of the both terms. Actually, training data set is literally about the train the model. And then a test data set is the when we get when we get an optimal model, we have to use the test data set uh, for to, uh, to validate the accuracy and the precision of the, our optimal model and to interpret the result based on the test data set. So and then the author also talk, this chapter also talk about the we should not we should not use the test data set when we try to up get when we try to get the optimal model process that actually uh, we we should not use the test data set for the for getting the getting an optimal model. That means when we use the test data set for the optimizing the model. There is a no data set to testing it to validate the that optimal model, and then we cannot make sure that uh, that model is optimized or not. And also, when we use the test data set for optimal model, that means our model tends to our model also fit uh, fit into fit to the test data set, which means we are not make sure if that data that model actually produced the predict the outcome uh, accurately or not. So in here, typical recommendation for the splitting data set, which means uh, 
when we try so when we try to split the data set our test next question gonna be the how we can divide our test uh, our data set so typical recommendation for the splitting data like a training versus test is the training training is the 60 percent and then a test is the 40 percent or 70 percent plus 30 percent and 80 percent and 20 percent gonna can be used depending on the size of the data set so i personally or uh, use the rule of thumb, maybe I just say based on the, my experience, most of the people usually prefer commonly used to the 80% plus 20%. I, I don't know about the 60% and 40% also can be used. But the thing is usually when we divide the training and test the data set, 80% and 20% gonna be uh, more commonly used among the, these three options. But anyway, it typical recommendation of the these three and then uh, it's actually splitting data actually based depending on the what size of the our data set it is which means we have a very very big data set like a two large data set we might not use the less training data set which means the more 60 percent and 40 percent uh divide gonna be more useful but if we have a two small data set we may be thinking about the spending the more uh, uh, higher proportion of the training data set to training the, our model more accurately. So that's the, what the typical recommendation of the data set. And then, and then when, okay, so now our question is how we can try to do the sampling. In, in the chapter, actually, uh, explains about the two types of the sampling. First one is the simple random sampling and the other one is the stratified sampling. So random sampling actually just the splitting the data set without any control of the, any data attribute. That means maybe if we have a data set like this, maybe this maybe table like this, it, Simple sam simple random sampling is a just kind of a, just kind of okay. Right here, up to the up to the top eighty percent of the data set, we are gonna use the training, and then the uh, rest of the twenty percent, we just uh, use the test. It is uh, just kind of a splitting data set, just kind of a kind of a first. First, the top 80% is the training, or maybe first, the top 20% of the data set gonna be used to test the data set. Very, very simple kind of a criteria when we divide into the data set. It does not, when we divide this uh, data set in this way, it is not associated with any kind of a control for the attribute of the data, data or, or structure of the data by itself. It is just kind of our intuition about okay, let's let's trim, let's extract the twenty percent of our data set up to the top, maybe test, and then eighty the other eighty percent is the training, or maybe in the middle we can cut the twenty percent in the middle, or maybe at the bottom, or maybe every every when you have the top top ten sample data set, maybe every Every two top two data set for the 10 sample, 10, 10, every 10 data set gonna be used to the test the data set. This kind of a very simple criteria is a kind of a simple random sampling techniques. So as you can see here in the R code, it actually tried to sample like a multiply by the 0 0.7, which means just kind of a 70% of the our data set is uh, used the training data set. We don't know which it is, but the thing is we just dividing it. Same thing for the carrot packages and then the R sample packages, and then also H2 packages. Yeah, at the bottom here. And then actually chapters actually try to compare to the which, which, which one is actually do the, the fits the very well between the test and training distributions. 
And then to do that, we can actually try to plotting each of the each of the sampling techniques. And then uh, you can uh, you can find the dead one uh, into uh, into the chapter two uh, figure here. Can you see the graphs plots? So here is a kind of like a, when we using the base R sample packages and carrot and R sample and H2O. So it looks like a, in this case, in case of the AMS housing sampling method, it seems like a carrot is a very well uh, similar distribution between the training and the test. So we might use the carrot sampling for the simple, if we use the simple random samplings. So actually red line represents the test, uh, this test observation distribution and then the black line actually training the distribution. So this one actually shows about the, we actually have a very similar kind of a sampling distributions when we using the using the simply simple random, uh, random sampling in this case, but it is not always the case for the data set because sometimes simple random sampling does not work very well. So in that case, we actually use the, what is called the stratify the sampling, which is down here. So certified sampling is that we can control the sampling so that our training and test set is the very similar distribution. Actually, coin, uh, uh, in the previous sections, when we do the simple random samplings for the AMS housing data set, we, can, we could get the similar distribution between the training and test data, test the data set, but that is not always the case in the simple random sampling, but stratified sampling actually guarantee, allows us to get to the training and test the set, have a very similar distributions. And then stratified sampling is actually very useful when we this pulse variable is a stability imbalance, imbalanced, which means 90% of our response variable is the yes or 10% is the no, that means we, if we, when we try to do the distribution, it is when we have a very highly rightly skewed. In that case, we can use the stratified sampling. We can get the training and test data have a very similar distribution. And also it is very useful when we had a very small sample size. Yeah, so, so to, to conduct the stratified samplings, we actually using the R sample packages. And then we can use, we can use actually make an argument called the strata options. And then we also determine the what's the proportion of our training sample size here. And then testing the sample size like right here, like this. And then we can get to the uh, probability table. We can we could we can find that the training and testing data set is a very similar, and then it's the 0.7 and 0.3 kind of distributions. Uh, data split with a similar uh, distributions. When we plot the both training and testing uh, testing uh, samples, we can find that the, there are actually overlap very well like this yeah so that's what i get when i try to run the code so so as i just said so the reason why we have a uh, various kind of uh, these kind of these sampling packages kind of like, uh, we actually have a uh, in the in practice, we always face encounter of the class imbalance the problem in our data set, which means when the one class is a very small portion of the observations, which means uh, we have uh, maybe maybe when we have a uh, three classificate three class categories in the in the our outcome variable, but the thing is 
class uh, class A actually have a uh, 85 85 percent and the class B is the 10 percent and class D is only five percent. This is actually have a very serious imbalance problem, which means we have to be very cautious about the when we splitting the our data set. So there is a two way we can thinking about the reducing the risk of the imbalance the data problem. One is the upsampling, which means when we have a data is a very sufficient, which means we have a very large set of the data set. We just try to try to make a size of the, our data set as equal to the size sample size of the layer sample class. That means maybe maybe when we have a when we have a class C category C only have a five percent in the in the previous uh, example like 85 and 10 or 5 percent maybe when we have a uh, only 5 percent of the class C that means A and B also have a 5 percent to the same size to to get to the sample this is what is called the upsampling downsampling means is uh, when we have a uh, data set is uh, not very sufficient or not very enough not that big we actually increasing the size of the layer samples, which means by repetitions or bootstrapping kind of process. So compared to the, these two options, we actually try to prefer to the downsampling, commonly use the downsampling compared to the upsampling, because we there is only only a few cases we can get the big 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 data set. So. That means most of the cases, we, our data set, our sample the data set is uh, not that sufficient or not that enough. So in that case, we usually using the downsampling approaches. So that means by increasing the size of the, our uh, sample size for the layer, layer class, and then we can try to build up the, our model based on the downsampling approaches. And also there is a uh, author also talk about the combination of the over and under sampling can be open successful, which is the synthetic minority over sampling techniques, which is uh, which is the smooth. I never heard of that this term before, but the thing is this one can be also possible. But in my in my experience, I never seen these kind of approaches before, and then uh, I don't know how to implement these kind of uh, this kind of approaches in R and then I don't know if there there are any R packages that allows us to do these kind of uh, combinations uh, yes, maybe, they, yeah. Yeah, 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 yes they are uh, oh, okay if you if you use the tidy models uh, framework uh -huh. uh, there is a library called themis uh famous Themis, yeah, Themis. Oh, okay. Okay, is uh, Themis is the, you know, the the justice uh, lady uh -huh. with, the, with the scale. <laughs> uh huh. Okay. Okay. That that that's the uh, that's the Greek that's the Greek goddess. Yeah, yeah, Themis. yeah. Okay. Themis. So yeah. Uh, they ch I guess they chose that name because of the balance, right? You know, trying to mm. balance an, mm. an imbalanced class. Mm. So in Themis, you're going to find you know that those techniques and other techniques. Uh, uh, okay. Code and everything. Uh, also, okay. Kian, to, uh, uh, just to make sure that you know that we are, uh, you know, for for future yeah. cohorts that we are, uh, yeah. you know, saying this right. I believe yeah. that the explanation it was a good explanation about the up sampling and the down sampling. Mm -hmm. But I believe you know, reading at the text right now, I uh -huh. believe they are back. They are backwards. Okay. What uh, do you mean the, the down sampling? The downsampling, uh -huh. it says here that it balances the data set by reducing the size of the abundant classes. Okay, so the downsampling is going to take that 5% mm -hmm. that you were explaining on that class mm -hmm. and it's going to downsample the rest of the classes to that 5%. Mm -hmm. okay. That is the downsampling. Okay, oh. the upsampling is when you take the majority ah, class oh, okay. and then yeah. you upsample. Yeah. 
the rest yeah. of the classes to that okay. majority class. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Sorry it's, for it's, that. It's just, it, it, yeah. just you know uh, inverting the. Yeah. The, yeah. Because I think okay. that I I I think that I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna explain explain right. oppositely because this one is Correct. actually down yeah down exactly. sampling and you know, this is uh, up sampling okay sorry about that yeah very good no, no, no problem yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it yeah, happens to anyone uh, it happens to anyone yeah it happens to me also yeah <laughs> yeah so okay okay so yeah down sampling is the uh, when the data is the sufficient and then we can keep right. all the sample for the rare sample and then you know, off sampling is the way we try to increase the size of the layer of samples through the bootstrapping exactly. or repetitions and also we also have a combination and then uh, there is a package called mm -hmm. Dermis, so we yes. can use that one yeah and then and then also we can use the class being waiting schemes for the overcome mm -hmm. the data imbalanced problem which means that this one is actually called the uh, panelized panelized modeling approaches you know what is this is the if we can get the class each class category is the weighting based on the hour maybe if we know about the population size is known we can actually calculate about what is called the class weighting analytic weights and then uh, based on the that weighting we can actually penalize the each each category uh representative let representativeness, which means if we have a uh, one class is a very large portion of the, our data set, that means we can penalize that data set by using the uh, lower value of the weighting, weighting uh, values. And then for the, uh, for the uh, layer class uh, categories, in that case, we can increase the our weight value to apply to that those values. Try to make a balance between the categories. So that's what is called the actually penalized modeling approaches, especially for the what is called the penalized regression model kind of things. That is actually kind of a one way to overcome the our data imbalance problem, or maybe penalize the logistic regressions. That actually means that the when we can estimate the analytic weights across the classes in our response variable. We can use that that one as a weights to adjusting to the adjusting the representativeness of the, each category inside the response variable. That's the what we call the penalized regression or penalized modeling approaches. Okay, so next one. Actually, chapter two actually have uh, too many contents and then uh, it's already 7.45. I personally think that I'm gonna try to as far as possible, but the thing is, the reason why I just try to explain this one is very slowly is uh, kind of like, uh, kind of, it is, I personally think that chapter two is uh, very, very important to understand the rest of the, this book contents. So that's the reason why I just try to understand uh, very well to, to these kind of concepts. But the thing is, I'm going to try to go as far as possible. And then uh, maybe if I cannot, maybe I can explain the rest of the contents in the next week. Does that OK? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, okay. if, uh, yeah. Also, in, in chapter three, yeah. I believe that you know if we try to cramp it, in uh -huh. cram it into a one day. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, there's too much to, to yeah. digest. So probably yeah. we'll need two days, you know, to try okay. to go a little bit slower, explaining yeah. the, the concepts, yeah. and then, you know, yeah. try to get correct. the discussion. Yeah, correct. Okay, agree. So mm -hmm. I will, so 2.3 is the, what is about the, okay, now we have the splitting data with a similar distribution for the training and the testing data set. So our next step gonna be the creating the model. So to to analyze and evaluating our data. So, but the, the problem actually here is the actually it might be the kind of a, fortunately we have a more than the one R packages to perform each algorithm. In the book, it actually says we have a 
more than 20 R packages that allows us to conduct a random forest. But the real problem in here is the, among the, these packages, there is a, some, some kind of the inconsistency in terms of the producing the result. And then the algorithm, that the how algorithm allows you to define the formula. So actually in here uh, is uh, talking about the more like a very general principle about the how, to, how the formula actually organized in R. So one type of the thing is uh, just kind of a specifying the symbolic representation of the term like a formula type of things. For example, why how, how does it call this one? But this symbol to X is the Y is the function of X, which means Y equals function. Right, you, you, usually yeah. usually it translates to explain, okay? Yeah. Y yeah. explained by X. Yeah, so, <laughs> so that is a kind of a, just kind of a we, what we actually familiar with, because when we, studying the mathematics we usually using the these kind of a very directive direct kind of a representation of the formula but this one is also kind of a very uh, some of the disadvantage which means that there is a no nest inline functions which means maybe if we y have a function of a just x1 and then the other one is a maybe pca x1 x x2 and then the other one is uh, maybe another function of the x3, et cetera. This, not, this is not the possible because uh, there is a no kind of uh, functions within the functions. And also these kind of approaches actually using, most using by the matrix based kind of a calculation, which means that once the model is implemented, there is a no way kind of a, kind of a replicated or decode or these kind of a, modeling calculations. And also it is not efficient for the uh, large wide data set, which means we have uh, too many too many columns of the variables, it is not that efficient. And also each variable also have a role is a very, uh, very limited because of the, this kind of uh, approaches actually have a kind of a very, very, uh, uh, one to one or kind of a one one to one kind of a corresponding relationship or associations, and also specifying multi multi barrier outcome is the clunky and Ill, Ill elegant, which means when we have uh, multiple responses, it is very hard to devise our model based on the, this representation like uh, y one and y two etc. And also there is also lack of the consistency problem also too. So, so to, to overcome this kind of a disadvantage, we actually you also have another type called the non-formula interfaces, which means that we actually separate the arguments about the predictor and outcome, which means that we actually have uh, like a functions and then we have the predictor and then we can listing the predictors in here and then comma, and then if we have uh, responses, we also listing the responses here separately, not the kind of uh, these kind of uh, formula representations. And also there is also called a uh, variable name specifications, like uh, specifying the feature and response with the character strings, like uh, we actually using the actual column name for the argument inside the command. So that's the kind of a many formula due to the, this kind of a many formula interfaces actually prevent us from the get to the consistent, cons, consistent result across the packages because uh, all of the packages has uh, their own kind of a way of the producing their result and then uh, their, uh, their own way of the interpreting the, their outcome, outputs especially. So, that kind of inconsistency of the formula formulations actually uh, enables us, uh, make us to hard to understand about the interpretation or analyzing those things. And then the other problem is that we have uh, too many engines, which means 
we had to over we had to actually use the some kind of a, what is I don't know about what is the engine means in R, but I actually heard this kind of a term for the first time in this book. So in in the book it says about the engines is used to overcome the consistent problem in the formula term in the previous one. And then mm -hmm. it actually allows us to the more consistency. But the thing is it is actually lack of the flexibility, which means when we when we looking at the this chapter here, it actually says about the there is a many engines kind of things, which means like a some more like a some kind of a method kind of arguments, and then uh, some of the syntax type of the computing to mm -hmm. to the to the predictions. So for example, like a linear things is a, we use the predict of the of a modeling object. And then a generalized linear model, we can actually predict the mode object and then a type is a response, which means we actually predict the, our outcome variable by using the modeling, our model, our model. And then the mixture is the posterior variable means the after the post test kind of a result. And then the decision is the some kind of a probability of the each categories, estimation of the probability of the each category can be choose. And then the random forest is a kind of a prediction like this. And then a gradient boosting motion is a type of the response. And then also what kind of a method we also use for the predictions. So it is a more like a, what is the engine means is a kind of a more like a argument for the what kind of a method or a method can be used to for the prediction predict to predict the, our outcome variables. That's the, uh, what okay, I understand. I can, yeah. I can give an example that maybe it will clarify you know what the engine is. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. For example, in the, if you can go to that table. Uh, uh, go go back to that table uh, okay. where you get the packages. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's take random forest. Okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Not random forest. Well, random forest. You are going to use right a tree base algorithm, right? Yeah. Okay, a tree base algorithm, mm -hmm. but the engine refers to really the specific package that you're going to use for that tree base algorithm mm. so let's say the tree based algorithm it can be a decision tree right mm -hmm. okay that mm -hmm. engine is going to be our part mm -hmm. or if you use random forest you can use like it says there there's ranger package mm -hmm. or also you can use the random forest package mm -hmm. that's the engine okay uh, in other words you have the tree base the algorithm uh -huh. is like the car Right, uh, you know, you you have okay. you have a sport car, the uh -huh. engine, the uh -huh. motor, the engine is the one that is going to you know make the car you know uh, uh, travel right you know uh, mm -hmm. uh, get 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 that get get that motion. So mm -hmm. the Ranger is one engine, mm -hmm. Random Forest is another engine, okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there's more more there. I, I'm just giving you two of the most commonly used, mm -hmm. okay. So in the chat, let me see if, you know, so we can, uh, as if, for example, random forest, mm -hmm. random forest, okay, mm -hmm. uh, engines, right? Uh -huh. uh, we can have a ranger, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. Or we can have random forest with a capital F. Okay. That refers really to the package. That you're going to use the the engine, the package that you're going to use to then, uh, you know, calculate that tree base uh, algorithm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. The same so. thing, for example, for uh, bo boosted trees. When you go to gradient uh, mm -hmm. boosted machines, uh -huh. uh, your engine could be XGBoost, or your uh -huh. engine could yeah. be like GBM, or yeah. your engine could be CatBoost. Yeah. Okay. Or yeah. or there's another package called GBM too. <laughs> yeah, okay? yeah, it's yeah. A, it's an old package, but you can use it. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So it is the it's really in R is really the package that you're going to use. That's the engine. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a direct relationship between package and the engine. 
the, mm -hmm. the, the, the algorithm is the, you know, the generalized a method that you're going to use to then you know uh, uh, get your your predictions uh okay so in here when you mm -hmm. when when we have uh, this third example like a carrot actually yeah. it says about the training is the is the engine from like a command from the carrot packages but mm -hmm. lm is actually come from the base r correct kind of a, that's the engine that method okay. that's the engine Okay, so yeah, so okay, this is because a more you like can a, use yeah, you can use like a pipeline, yeah, pipeline kind of thing. So training, yeah, and then LM like this. Exactly, so, or you can use also GLM yeah. too because GLM yeah, right. incorporates the penalize yeah. and regressions. Yeah. Okay, yeah, right, and also right. incorporates logistic regression too. Yeah, yeah, okay. right, yeah. That but that's oh. the engine. That method that's okay. the engine. Ah, so, mm -hmm. okay, so this one is a more like a Unix kind of a based kind of a, a approaches. So it actually right. have a kind of a every package as an application actually connects to together and then by connecting the each packages as a separate right. engines. And then we can get to the more consistent result by combining to the Command mm -hmm. within the each sem each packages. Oh, okay, gotcha. Correct, correct. The, the, yeah. the only thing is that you know, uh, you can associate for more complex models. You can asso associate mm. the engine to the package. Okay? Yeah, yeah, right. Because right. you're not going to call it. But there, there's some exceptions, and one exception is LM because LM is from base R. In other words, yeah, LM yeah. is not a package. It's a function within a package called you know from base R. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and GLM too. GLM yeah. also comes, you know, uh, uh, embedded in in Bazer uh, AR. That's what they call them engines, not not really packages, engines. Mm. But usually, it it it's a one on one relationship between an engine and a package. Usually, yeah, right, right. Like a like a app in the Unix Unix system. So one app right. actually one app actually uh, the outcome of the one output of the one app actually gonna be the transfer to the input for the, the next next app and then uh the mm -hmm. outcome of the second second app also handy to the the other app etc so it's the more like a nesting kind of a structure or mm -hmm. maybe pipeline kind of a connection to the it's it's, it's more a yeah. pipeline really. yeah it's more a pipeline, pipeline. because what okay. we are using is for example in yeah. that ln caret what I'm telling is that I'm going to use this data frame called AIMS. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use this formula, okay? Sell yeah. price explained yeah. by every predictor, yeah. but the engine, you know, yeah. the way that you are, are going to use to get yeah. those results is going to be yeah. LM. Yeah. Okay. A linear regression. Yeah. So in here, in this case, like uh, based on the LM kind of approaches, we can try to train in our data set. Like mm -hmm. a pipeline, yeah. So, but these each one actually come from the LM is actually base R. Base R, correct. Yeah, and the training command is actually called the carrot packages. Carrot so, packages, yes. So, by using the command from the different packages and then the connecting to the these two together to get to the more comprehensive and more consistent result. That's mm -hmm. the what many engines can do okay i understand fully thank you very much okay good yeah okay yeah okay so that's the very good to know and mm -hmm. then and then the sampling pad method i think it is already uh, 801 uh, yeah i think we reached eight o'clock already <laughs> yeah okay. yeah so so two, yeah but maybe, it, was a, it was a good session Good session. Yeah. So rest of the chapter, like a 2.4 and 2.7, I will mm -hmm. do them next week. And sure. then uh and then uh, we can wrapping up the chapter two next week. Uh-huh. Yeah. We'll we'll continue okay. in this 2.4. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We we gonna start the 2.4 and then mm -hmm. again we can we can wrap up the chapter two next week. Okay, excellent. Okay, so thank you very much, oh. and then uh, uh, see you next week. Have a good, have a good, uh, happy Easter. <laughs>
Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it's the happy Easter. Yeah, you too. Happy Easter. Happy yeah, Easter, the, the, yeah. The, the, happy the Easter. Bunnies, the uh, bunnies. Yeah. The bunnies are yeah. loose. <laughs> yeah. Have a nice weekend and then have fun. Okay. How, how's the weather there? In, uh, in Georgia? It's, it's a little bit cloudy in here, but. Yeah, I'm asking a, because I, I was uh, I was uh, watching the, the Masters tournament, the golf tournament in Augusta, uh, uh -huh. Georgia, uh -huh. and it was it, it, it was raining like crazy, you know, and there was lightning. Yeah, yeah, everything. yeah, yeah. Yesterday, yeah, uh, it rains a lot, so yeah. And then, I mean, uh, and right, then right now, Florida here is overcast, so you know, I yeah. guess the weather is coming down, you know, from yeah. yeah. Now is the weather. Weather looks fine, but I didn't I didn't look outside, but. I personally okay. think that rain stops and then it looks okay. So, okay. So happy Easter and then I'll uh, see you in the next week. Sure. Okay. okay. Bye bye. Looking forward to it. Bye. Okay. <laughs> yep.